How's it going guys? We have a difficult question for hematology step one internal medicine TCK. Before we start, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give you a like, really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram, melman underscore medical, and me at channel man underscore medical links down below. For me telegram links to the telegram group channel down below. And I start the clip. Four-year-old boy, 12 hour history of severe pain in his hands. He has a history of a condition in which the beta chain of hemoglobin is less hydrophilic than normal blood smear is shown, which the following is the patient at greatest risk for. Then we have this blood smear here, which many of you have no idea what we're looking at. Now, when you get a US simile question of this nature, where you have no idea what's going on, sometimes you can ascertain the correct answer by glancing at the answer choices and saying, well, if these are the answers I'm contending with here, what condition could this uh, question possibly be referring to? Okay, so that's a potential starting point for some of you. Now, others might look at this descriptor of beta chain that's less hydrophilic than normal and know that that's sickle cell, okay? which you're going to have a beta mutation where we have glutamic acid to valine substitution. Okay, it's a missense mutation. So glutamic acid is negatively charged and it's becoming uncharged valine. So if you have something that's charged goes to uncharged, you're making it more hydrophobic slash lipophilic and therefore less hydrophilic, okay? And an answer on one of the offline NBME forms for the mechanism of sickling is that the beta chain, quote, slips into a complementary hydrophobic pocket on the alpha chain. It might sound obscure, but even for that question back in the day, if you know the beta chain is more hydrophobic because of glutamic acid to valine, you could assess, well, that's probably the only answer that's correct because it's talking about a hydrophobic interaction. Then you have this blood smear and you say, well, I still don't know. But if you were able to assess that this is sickle cell, this is referring to how or depicting how old jolly bodies, okay? So we get autosplenectomy in sickle cell due to repeated micro infarcts of the microvasculature of the spleen. You need to know that mechanism as well. So patients have autosplenectomy, meaning they lose their spleen. It's the equivalent as though they've had a surgical splenectomy, even though they clearly haven't, okay? So we treat sickle cell patients, we manage them as though they don't have a spleen. And that entails giving them prophylaxis up until the age of five with penicillin. That's a 2CK detail. But on step one, they might tell you that a kid is already on penicillin prophylaxis and then ask you why, okay? So you need to know that patients who have splenectomy, such as surgical or autosplenectomy in the setting of sickle cell, they need vaccines against Neisseria meningitis, Haemophilus influenza type B, Strep pneumo. Those are encapsulated organisms. The reason there's a greater susceptibility to encapsulated organisms is because in order to clear encapsulated organisms, we need to opsonize and phagocytose. So what that means is we have C3B complement protein, IgG, immunoglobulin. So C3B, IgG, the immune system's two major opsonins, they're going to bind to the capsule of encapsulated organisms, and then they are cleared out by the white pulp of the spleen. The spleen houses 50% of the immune system's reservoir of macrophages. So if we lose the spleen, we lose a massive phagocytic capacity that the immune system has and therefore increase susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. So if the US simile asks you which organism in particular patients with splenectomy slash autosplenectomy or increased risk for, the answer is strep pneumo. Now, some students say, but wait, why not Neisseria meningitis or Haemophilus influenza type B? Like, why strep pneumo specifically? Good fucking question. Okay, it's just, it's what they want. So, of course, there will be increased susceptibility to all of them. And you have to be mindful that you could get, let's say, a non-blanching rash with meningitis, and that could be Neisseria meningitis. But they really like strep pneumo, okay? So... And by the way, how will jolly bodies are nuclear remnants? I should have probably mentioned that before if I didn't already. So let's just hop to the answer choices here. Choice A, Borrelia sepsis, wrong fucking answer. Borrelia burgdorferi, obviously Lyme disease, okay. You get erythema chronica migrans, it's just a target rash. It actually doesn't even have to be a target rash. It can just be a circular rash without a clearing. Uh, but you can get, obviously, your erythema chronica migrans, you get Bell's palsy, okay. So different things with Lyme disease, the spirochete, okay. Uh, more of a corkscrew or spiral-shaped uh, bacterium. Borrelia recurrentis causes recurring fever and non-exist on US It's a long discussion. Point is, wrong fucking answer. Choice B, destruction of platelets to antibodies against glycogen proteins 2B3A, wrong fucking answer. First to ITP, idiopathic, and slash immune thrombocytopanic purpura. It's high yield, okay? I mean, I've made plenty of clips on this stuff. Classically viral infection in a school-age kid. It can sometimes be in, in women 30s to 40s idiopathically, but it will be 
type two hypersensitivity. Anybody's going to collect proteins 2B3 and platelets, and then we get uh, an isolated decreased uh, platelet count with an increased bleeding time, normal PT, PTT, treat with steroids, IVIG, splenectomy. Wrong fucking answer. Choice C, gram positive diplococcal sepsis, nebulous only answer, choice correct answer. This refers to our strep pneumo. Okay, so that upped the difficulty a little bit. Not dramatic, but holy shit, uh, strep pneumo is gram positive diplococci. Don't confuse with nasaria, gonorrhea, and meningitis, which, which are gram negative diplococci. So that's, uh, that's also just a high yield micro point. Okay, so gram positive diplococci, strep pneumo, and as I already talked about, there's increased risk of strep pneumo sepsis. Real quick, the other answer choice is choice D, hemarthrosis, wrong fucking answer, classically hemophilia A and B on USMLA, excellent recessive, going to be a school-aged kid who has bleeding into the knee. They really like that. They can say an, a maternal uncle died from uh, minor head trauma. Okay, so you're going to have uh, an isolated increase in PTT, normal PT, and bleeding time. Wrong fucking answer. Choice C, schistocytosis, thrombocytopenia, wrong fucking answer. First to HUS, TTP, hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay, obviously disparate mechanisms. So hemolytic uremic syndrome, EHEC, 0157H7, Shigella, and then liberating uh, toxins that are going to cause inflammation of the renal afferent arterioles where platelets are required to plug the damage. So you get a uh, drop in platelets, thrombocytopenia. Platelets are going to jut out into the microvascular lumina, cause shearing of RBCs as they fly past, causing schistocytosis. And then, of course, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura is going to be Adam TS13 uh, antibodies or deficiency, which causes a T cell activation and inflammation, resulting in similarly thrombocytopenia with schistocytosis. Wrong fucking answer. You know the deal. I'm going to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe my channel. I appreciate your time. That's it.